Good morning and welcome to Salem's worship service this morning. This morning we'll be opening up with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms found at 133 in the hymnal. on November 7th. Please contact me to schedule your meetings for Zoom. The deadline to have your meetings is October 4th. That gives you two weeks to have your meetings. All forms will be sent to you via your email. Please note that each committee leader is responsible for contacting the members of your committee about the meeting. The study of God's Word is still going on here at Salem. Please join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for Sunday school and on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock p.m. for Bible study. Both are via Zoom. Viewers for September 13th, worship service was 47. Please, please, Salem members, remember to share our Sunday services with your family, with your friends, and on your social media pages. The offering for September 13th was $4,527.31.
thank you so much, Salem members, for your continued support of your church. God bless each and every one of you. sick sick so very long when she heard about Jesus was passing by so she joined the gathering throng oh but when when she got through someone asked her what are you trying to do she said if I Touch his garment, and I know I'll be made whole right now. She stood there and cried, Oh Lord, oh Lord, and oh Lord, oh Lord. She said, If I could just touch his garment, and I know I'll be made whole right now. She spent her money here and there Until she had no, had no more to spare The doctors, they done all they could But they medicine would do no good But still, the Savior didn't see But still he turned around and cried Somebody touch me She said it was I Who touched your karma And I know I'll be made Whole right now She stood there and cried Oh, 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 oh. She said it was I Who just touched this karma and I know I'll be made whole right now. Welcome. This is September the 20th in the year of our Lord, 2020. My name is Develius Bright, and this is Salem United Methodist Church. Welcome to this time of the sermon. Well, as many of you already know, I consider myself a lectionary preacher, meaning that I usually restrict myself to the selected lectionary scriptures for that week as my main text for that week's sermon. I started doing that long time ago because I didn't accidentally want to start selecting scriptures that merely some supported my own previously already held beliefs. I thought that if I selected, uh, if I thought that if the, the lectionary selected the scriptures for me, then I could assure myself that and my congregation that I was bringing a word from God that was from God and not Develius. Well, miraculously, God always provides. And God makes sure, makes sure that whatever the scripture the lectionary provides for that given week, it is perfect 
for that week's message. Now, I want to remind you that I'm not a motivational speaker and my purpose on Sunday mornings is not to purely entertain you during this sermon. But I was sent here to Salem by our bishop to serve this particular congregation in word, sacrament, and order. The word that I'm sent to serve is the word of God, sometimes in the form of a Sunday morning sermon. My sermons are crafted from words and based upon many years of theological training. And for me, they are an art form, my chosen form of art. God and scriptures are more than just my creative inspirations. I believe that they are also the medium of my art. As an artist, I am also a priest within a certain community of faith. And that combination is planted deeply in our African tradition, traditions of creativity and spirituality. Today's sermon comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It happens during a portion of Jesus' teachings about a strange kind of economy, the economy of God. I love this parable because it contains um, a story about a businessman. And I came to the ministry from the world of business as a homiletic artist who has been educated in both business and theology, my faith in the lectionary to provide just the right message for our community of faith has once again been rewarded by a sweet and loving God. Now, share this sermon with me from Matthew 20, 1 through 16, about a businessman who had problems when it came to paying his workers for a day's work. The sermon title is, You Got It Backwards. You Got It Backwards. Let us pray. Gracious Father, most merciful God in heaven, Lord, we love you, we lift you up, and we magnify your holy name. But right now, Heavenly Father, we need to hear a word from you. So please, Father, please, remove this humble messenger and leave standing up here in this place, Lord, your good, your true, and your perfect word for your people. So that when we all leave this time together in this hour of the sermon, Lord, we will leave with that blessed assurance that your glory and your glory alone has been shown for. And that indeed your goodness your grace, and your mercy will continue to be manifested in our lives. This and all other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You got it backwards. My undergraduate degree in, in business required the study of the subjects of subjects like accounting, uh, economics, business mathematics. However, my graduate studies in theology revealed to me that God has his own economy. As one professor told my class, in God's economy, the world has it backwards. In the world's economy, there are winners and losers. So the person who dies with the most toys wins. However, in God's economy, the winner in the world, the winners in the world are often the losers in the kingdom of God. Wealth and, and power are valued in the world and, and those who have all of those things rule the rest of us harshly, refusing to share that wealth and that power with the rest of us. The poor and, and the weak have something also. 
a promise from God. God's economy promises that the last will be first and the first will be last. Now, seriously considering a world in which the last will be first and the first will be last stretches even the most flexible business imagination. Balance sheets, budgets, and time cards are inflexible realities of a modern business economy. Profit is the motive of business. The goal of an American economy full of businesses is to keep growing and expanding the profits of all. Yet the Bible asks, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his life? Cost, price, inventory and things like that are all necessary and essential in a successful business calculation. There are precise calculations that govern how you measure business success. For example, if you are providing food for a crowd of people um, in a way that both turns a profit and satisfies all your customers, in business language, what you have to do is you, you have to estimate the cost of the food plus the, the, the cost of uh, preparing and serving the food. And then you have to make sure that, that all of that is covered in the price of each plate that you sell so that you can reach your desired margin of profit. All that's business language. That type of calculation is the, is the same whether it's a nonprofit banquet that you're talking about or a fast food franchise. The calculation of profit is very rigid and inflexible. However, in the Bible, you simply need to take five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish and God Give so much increase that you'll wind up with 12 baskets of leftovers. It's all backwards. The first will be last and the last will be first, but not according to common business principles. But here, here, but here is the problem with common business principles. They're not always morally acceptable in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, hungry people should be fed, regardless of how much it costs or how much food you have. It's a moral imperative. Naked people must be clothed, regardless of the manufacturing cost. Homeless people need homes, regardless of their credit rating. Sick people need medical help, regardless of of how affordable the health care is. According to common business principles, only those who can afford the price of a meal, a shirt, a shirt, or a home can have those things. Of course, business principles have an inherent morality to them also. And that morality assumes that all of us want what is best for the common good. Now, of course, we know how that works in reality. The assumption that businesses will act in the best interest of the most people, well, that creates trust. The trust that's needed to conduct business with strangers. And we know that human emotions like greed and envy and pride cause business people to harm their enemies and to do it intentionally. Laws have been written to, to stop greedy business people from putting dangerous and defective products into the stream of commerce all so that they can increase their profits. My friends, business principles can become idols 
when church folk prefer them to God's economy. God's economy helps the saints to prioritize their business principles in ways that seem backwards to the world. In the world, we speculate and invest, but in the church, we step out on faith. In the world, we pay dues, but in the church, we give sacrificially. In the world, we make payroll, but in the church, we sow into the lives of our staff. In the world, we pay bills, but in the church, we finance our ministry. Worldly Christians often confuse worldly business practices with God's economy, and they do so at their own peril. Worldly Christians believe that if they would only apply sound business and financial principles to the church, then they'll restore and revive the church. For decades, church pews have continued to empty out. And all of their buildings sit silent night after night after night throughout the week. There's been a slow and steady decline in, in church membership. All the time, the church has been practicing sound business principles, meticulously observing every part of their financial statements. Since worldly Christians aren't concerned with God's economy, it falls to the clergyman or woman to remind them about God's economy. How you conduct church business does more to attract new members than even great preaching does. Unless you sow seed into good soil, you don't become fruitful. And the fertile soil that bears fruit is the human heart that is transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. Do you want to bear God's fruit? If you think that you will bear God's um, fruit by being a good accountant, then you got it backwards. Just before our selected scripture, Jesus is teaching his disciples who've been asking him questions about God's economy. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, in the 16th verse, Jesus um, tells a rich man just how difficult it will be for him to enter into the kingdom of heaven. All because he was so attached to his earthly possessions in the world's economy. The disciples told Jesus that they had given up everything to follow him. And Jesus assured them that all, although in the world's economy, they are risking everything to follow him. In God's economy, they would regain a hundred times more than everything that they would have risked. They would even gain eternal life. The disciples feared that they might, they might lose their homes and their property by leaving and following Jesus. But they had it backwards. In Matthew 19 and 29 it says, and everyone who has left Houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. In verse 30, Jesus punctuates that first statement and begins the next parable with the next 
in the very same words. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus ends our selected text with the same words. Words that indicate that we've got it backwards. When Jesus goes directly to our uh, our, our parable in, in today's scripture reading, we can see in Matthew's 20th chapter that Jesus is illustrating God's economy and the fact that we earthly businessmen and women all too often get it backwards. In Matthew 20 and 1, it begins, For the kingdom of heaven is like, then it goes on. You know, some people read parables that are introduced like this and they assume that Jesus is talking about what happens when we all die and go to heaven off in paradise. But the kingdom of heaven is closer than you might realize. Whenever the saints of God act in a way that Jesus describes as as being like the kingdom of God, there is the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. Whenever the men and women of God get together and they act like Jesus says that we act in the kingdom of God, there is the kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of heaven. Right here on earth. Whenever the principles that Jesus illustrates are being, uh, 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 as being like the kingdom of heaven or being practiced in your life, then you're experiencing the kingdom of heaven right now on earth. And when the saints of Windsor Village United Methodist Church over there in Houston followed their pastor in a process they call kingdom building, they started providing housing and education and business opportunities to people right now. The kingdom is here on earth. Similarly, when Jesus speaks to his disciples about what the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus expected them to, as he said, go and do likewise. In this parable, Jesus describes a businessman who owns a vineyard. The man grows large amounts of grapes to press, bottle, and ferment into wine. Then he takes it to the market for sale. Like modern businessmen, he makes more money when he minimizes his cost and maximizes his profits. On this particular day, the businessman apparently lost his business mind and completely violated the business principle of the timesheet. The business timesheet tells a manager how many hours an employee has worked so that they can be paid for the time that they worked. No more and no less. For some reason, on that day, the day that represents the kingdom of heaven, the landowner started employing workers bright and early in the morning, long before the marketplace even opened up and most of the merchants opened their shops for the day. When he went back at the beginning of the business day, he hired more workers to go out and work in his vineyard. Later, several times during the day, the man returned over and over again, hiring more and more workers, each starting increasingly at later hours of the workday. Finally, the man hired his last workers when there were only a few hours left in the workday, and he sent them out into the fields to work. Jesus tells how the landowner lined up the workers at the end of the day to pay them their final payment. 
He placed the workers who started last in the front of the line. Then he paid everybody a full day's pay. All of them received exactly the same amount. Well, the last workers in the line were the first workers selected in the day. And those were the ones who had worked the most hours in the day. But the landowner didn't follow what was written on the workers' timesheet, violating a basic business principle at the time. The landlord didn't make the same kind of profit on that day that he ordinarily would have. And that was bad news for the landowner, but it was good news for the workers. They all got paid. All of them got paid the same day's wage. Now, the Bible doesn't speak to the celebration of the, of the late workers who got more than they expected, but it does talk about the early workers who grumbled. Grumbling is what the Bible calls it when people talk among themselves and not directly to the person that they're mad at. <laughs> That's what the Bible calls grumbling. But you see, the landlord heard the grumbling because truth be told, when grumblers grumble, they only grumble so that the person that they're mad at eventually hears what they're grumbling about. Yeah, grumbling may be a, a passive-aggressive way of settling conflicts, but remember that the children of God were notorious grumblers. As they were journeying through the, the wilderness with Moses and Aaron, they were always grumbling about the things that they didn't have anymore now that they weren't slaves in Egypt. Saints grumble in church to this day. They grumble instead of speaking their truth directly to the person that they're mad at. It happens all the time. Well, the landowner answered the grumbling workers directly. And he called them friends. In verse 13, he acknowledged the disagreement that the workers had with his calculation of their pay. But he insisted that he had the right to be generous with his money. The landowner draws into question not only the timesheet calculations, but the true reason that the early workers were grumbling. In verse 15, it says, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? That is where our message for today can be found. The landowner knows that he is within his rights to give his money to whomever he wants. But the early workers are envious because they're comparing the value of their labor with those who, who started to work later in the day using normal business principles. Sometimes when God moves in the heart of some saints to, to give other Saint something. Do you know people get jealous? <laughs> Truth be told, preachers use that jealousy between saints all the time. It's a, great, it's a great way to have an effective church fundraising drive. Because when people see your name on the fundraising bulletin board, they want their name on the board too. And in that way, we all raise the money that we need for the church. You see, we're consistently comparing ourselves to each other, both in the world and in church. But what would happen if there was no scarcity and there was an infinite supply of goods and services in the world economy? What would happen 
if we had everything that we needed in the world economy? Well, demand would drop and prices would fall. No matter how much inventory you moved, your profit margins would not increase, not one bit. And you'd have to adjust your cost of production down to zero. You'd have to fire all of your employees and cancel all of your contracts. Because you see, the world economy could not exist. But God's economy would flourish. Scarcity and fear help the world economy, the world's economy, because, but in God's economy, We have all of that backwards. With God, we fear not. With God, all is free for the asking. The price has already been paid. With God, regardless of your hours or the hours that you work, you receive exceedingly, abundantly more in your wages than you could have ever thought to ask or even write down on a timesheet. That's God's economy. God's economy baffles your worldly accountants and enrages your earthly attorney. And it causes business people in the world to have migraine headaches. They operate on normal business principles. They don't understand God's economy. And it causes them to grumble among themselves. God requires more of an accountant than just balanced accounts. Their life has to add up. God requires more from an attorney than just a record of courtroom wins and big money settlements. God requires more of business people than to just turn more and more profits and to expand your bottom line. They all have it backwards. It's how much you give, not how much you save that God wants in God's economy. It's how far ahead, it's not how, how far ahead you get, it's how many people you bring along with you that matters in God's economy. It's not how well you stay within your church budget, but how many people are being saved by your church budget. That is what God judges on Judgment Day. Let's not get it backwards. When we grumble against our church or its members, we're really grumbling against God because God put all of us here in this church together. And that is what God told Moses and Aaron when, when the children of Israel were grumbling against them out in the wilderness. Shoot. Some church members might even try to, to boycott a business. You know, you boycott a business in order to force them to, co to comply with your wishes. But if you boycott your church... Whose money is it that you're keeping? Don't get it backwards. Your offerings are to God, not the church. <laughs> Keep your money for the church because the church doesn't have a heaven or a hell to send you to. But don't mess with God's money because God is God all by God's self. And God keeps better records than even the IRS does when it comes to settling your heavenly accounts. Withholding your gifts will certainly get the church's attention, but those gifts belong to God. As your pastor, sometimes I have to let you know what's at risk. A church might run like a business, but 
church business operates on God's economy. In God's economy, sometimes it feels like you got it backwards. And that is the message for today. Amen. Amen. Sometimes when you apply worldly principles to church business, you can't help but to get it backwards. But knowing that is a blessing all to itself. Because when you know where your blessings are coming from, you can protect it, you can cherish it, and you can continue to get blessed year after year after year. If this sermon has been a blessing to you, Please receive this benediction from me. Go forth in peace. May the grace of our Lord, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you now, henceforth, and forever. And will all who agree with me say, Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a fantastic day.